Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Open Mic Podcast. My name is Caroline. I'm a junior at Columbia University, and I'm so excited to be hosting this series where we'll be talking about school and life and everything in between. Each episode will feature a new topic and a different guest. And today, I'm so excited to be introducing my good friend, William Zhang. Will, thanks so much for being here with me today. It's nice to be here. You want to give a quick introduction as to who you are and what you study? Sure. My name is William Zhang. I am a senior studying applied math, minor in CS at Columbia, and um, I'm from Long Island. That's how I know Carol. So we knew each other from high school. We're from, not from the same school district, but from like around the same area of Long Island. And we, Will is one year older than me. So I um, came in as a freshman, he was a sophomore, and he's studying applied math, concentrating in CS. And so today, Will is going to talk to us about kind of his journey throughout high school, what his experience at Columbia was like and what he kind of plans on doing after college. So we can get started with how your high school career was and how that influenced your decision to go into what you're majoring in now. Yeah, sure. Um, Well, in high school, I was part of the math team. I did all the, um, I guess, math related things I could do. I even uh, volunteered or kind of part-time worked at a math museum in the city. Uh, so I had an interest in math mm-hmm. and um, I, there was also a good research program at my school. So I also got into uh, science research and through those two, like basically working on cool projects involving basically applying math to certain things. I was like, you know, this applied math thing is not that bad. So I decided that I'd go to school to study applied math. Were you very involved in Math Olympiad or Math Leads like throughout all of your four years or did you start even earlier than that? No, no. I say the first year when you get into high school, when I got into high school, I thought I could be cool. So I took, you know, the classes like intro to guitar and ceramics. <laughs> really? And you guys had that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did like, I was on the track team for a little bit. So I didn't really do science Olympiad or math team. It was more like the second year of high school where I was like, hey, uh, I, I think I'll do more of the nerdy stuff now. I realized I wasn't good at being cool. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, that's what happened. Okay. Did you continue doing sports throughout sophomore and through senior year? Somewhat. Like I tried to do a comeback for track. That didn't really work out. And then I did a little bit of badminton throughout. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. I mean, you're math, you're a math lead. So that kind of counts, right? We did have like meets where you go face off against teams in Nassau County or so. It was like, it was like you go on a bus, you do you like do math for like 30 minutes and you get back on the bus. You know, it's not, it wasn't real sports. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, math was fun. I was on math leads too for, for four years in high school. And before that in middle school, I started in middle school or and in elementary school. So I did like math Olympiad. Um, but I mean, how was your like research experience though? Like you said that your school had a really good research program. How did you get started in that? I think sophomore year, same same time where I decided to be a nerd, I decided to do science research stuff too. And I think one of the things you had to do was just cold email professor, see if we can get into a lab to work over the summer for. And that's what I had done. There's new faculty at Stony Brook University on Long Island. It was a condensed matter physics lab, which was just basically like, uh, it, it's a fancy name for saying like material science kind of stuff. Yeah, new faculty. It was, uh, and he was willing to take on a high school student. So I joined that lab. And that was, I was it for that summer. And I kept on going that lab for uh, uh, all high school. Oh, nice. Yeah. How was the experience as a high schooler in a lab? It was, it was interesting. Like, I got to do a lot of random things, I'd say. Like, I had, um, one of my first tasks to do was build a heat and sound insulated box. Oh. Right? So I drew up some designs for this box. I ordered parts for this box. I built the box things like that, you know, and then I learned how to use a microscope, not like a typical microscope, but it's like, at the time it was like a 30 year old microscope, but apparently it was very expensive. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was called an AFM, an atomic force microscope. So it's like a a little tip that it could scan the surfaces of things to take an image of. And I'd sit there for hours watching the AFM do its work. and yeah, a lot of my work centered around, you know, playing around with this microscope, mm-hmm. you know, making samples and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, I also had the opportunity to build computers for them, run simulations, write code, 
So it came from building a box to doing some other stuff. So that's so cool. Do yeah. you think your like high school class classes and what you learned in high school was really like directly applicable to your research, or did you have to do a lot of self learning? Well, to build the box, I think I had taken like an intro engineering course at my school, mm -hmm. which is the simplest, silliest wood making class ever. It was it was an interesting class. We had to draw like diagrams of like how to build like certain things. So I mean, I drew a pretty good diagram of the box, I think. Um, and then with respect to coding, um, building a computer and other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that stuff, some of it I had to learn there. Like I had never really interacted with the command line before. You know, it was always just like you spin up your like NetBeans or whatever, your Java thing. And it's like a very nice IDE and you don't go outside of those bounds. And then I had to learn how to do that. And the physics, you know, it was like, well, we take physics, uh, the way we did our school did it was we learned it like in our third to fourth years. So I got there second year and I really didn't know that much physics. So yeah, I had a textbook and the, the professor was willing to help teach. And then there were some grad students who were also very helpful. So that's how I learned the physics in the lab. Okay. And um, yeah, so and then other stuff, I, I would say that um, when I usually had problems, I probably searched up papers, reading all those typical things that you do in a lab. That's probably how I got the other stuff for. But the school, schooling that I had um, was helpful, but the lab members were also very, very helpful. And what about like other classes that you took? What were like the most helpful classes for college that you took in high school? Well, anything that had AP attached to it because you got credit for that. True. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Were you Those able were to transfer a lot of them over? Yeah, I think I... I basically like, I mean, for New York schools, right? Like you got to take like 16, 15 to 18 credits per semester, yeah. right? Something like that. And then at Columbia specifically, there are a lot of non-tech requirements. So for me, I'm an engineer. So I have a bunch of requirements that are required of me, you know, technical <laughs> and non-technical. Mm -hmm. And so I have to take a certain amount of courses within technical and non-technical fields. For the non-technical ones, um, I actually... Believe it or not, I had not taken a single non-tech at Columbia because of how much AP credit I had. I was able to transfer all 16. Then I took some random math course that gave me an extra one for help. So I was filled. So I didn't have to take like an intro to, I mean, not saying that they're bad classes, like an intro to like I said, uh, some kind of art mm -hmm. uh, or something. I, But not saying that they're bad classes because I really enjoyed the core requirements at Columbia. Those were some of my favorite classes actually. Um, but I had more, but basically, yeah, those core, the, the, the credits that I had really helped me take a lot more of the courses that I was interested in. It just gave me freedom. So it's just better to have the option. Yeah. So definitely that, those helped. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, preparation for college, a lot of the intro courses that you see as an engineer is some of the stuff that you did in high school. So as long as you pay attention during those courses, you'll be fine. It's always good to have a nice background there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, other than that, a lot of the learning done in college is really just college specific. Like the one, the courses that I remember and think were the best. I don't think any extra prep would have been like helpful. Cause I mean, like goal is to learn that, right? But yeah. definitely having like a strong background in the basics and knowing how to solve problems. Uh, it's probably the best thing you could do. And the classes that probably prepared me the most for that but things that prepared me the most for that weren't really classes. I'd say it's more like the math competition stuff. And, and just like, I also did coding competitions and other things. Those helped. Was it in high school that you did coding competitions? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So how are, I know like college, you guys have like your hackathons, right? And your other competitions. So how does that kind of differ from high school into college? Well, I mean, this may change because I mean, the kids of this generation are now very code centric, but mm -hmm. Way, the way I remembered it was I did my first hackathon in high school and it was an MIT blueprint thing. Mm -hmm. And it was really nice, really cool. I learned a lot. Well, I didn't really build much, but I learned a lot. Uh -huh. And it was like a 12 hour so session. And it was cool. Like you got a lot of swag, you know, you had food and you were just coding and it was nice. It just felt like a little party kind of thing. And I liked that. So when I went to college and I did at least four plus hackathons um and they were always so fun you know you got a lot of swag you got employers trying to give you stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, 
they probably won't. I mean, like they're just giving stuff away, right? And then you just run around trying to get as much stuff as you can. And then, you know, they had like random little competitions. I know at Penn Apps um, mm-hmm. at some point in my freshman year, there were like races and ice, ice skating rinks open. And like they gave you like a lot of coffee and lots of food. And you got to learn a lot too. Like you got to build things with your friends. It was always really a nice affair. So I'd say like um, the competitions that I mentioned earlier were like coding competitions where it's like, oh, write this algorithm, make it run this fast. This is how many stars you get if you get this uh, this amount right, basically, or something like that. Mm-hmm. But the hackathon thing is just so much more, oh, what do you want to build? You can build this way and then you can just, and then I have like a bunch of tutorials and people to help you out and a lot of food and a lot of fun. It was always like, a, just, just a good time. I think that those are good times. You should yeah. definitely go. Plus you don't get to sleep. I mean, like, okay. I feel like that's a common theme in high school, college, right? So it's like, it's like a party for nerds. It's good. Party for nerds. I, I, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Those are some of the best times. How do you decide which ones to go to? Do you, is it like through a club or do you just get a group of friends that want to go to this hackathon and you guys just go? Well, the way I did it, I kind of just applied to the ones that I wanted to go to. And, you know, a bunch of people from your school are going to. So you just like, maybe you post in the Facebook group, hey, I'm going to this one, you know, mm. through. And to find them, I mean, there's like this MLH hacks and a bunch of other things. I mean, things have changed due to like the pandemic and a lot of other things. And they might be even virtual hackathons. Mm-hmm. But uh, in that heyday, um, it was just, you heard about it, you applied for it. Uh, and then they accepted you, give you a little bit of money to get there. And then you go there. And the good thing about New York was that a lot of things were close. Like you want to go to Hack MIT in Boston, you take a you take a bus. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to go to Penaps, you want to go to Philadelphia, you take a you take a bus. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to go to Princeton for a hackathon, you can take a bus. Yeah, that's nice because like New York is like central, like the central point for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just you go to the Port Authority, you take a bus. Everything is bus related. Uh, <laughs> very good. Yes. Uh, that was. <laughs> How about outside of hackathons? What do you like to do? I had a lot of random interests in college, you know. Um, I mean, the majority of the time I was working, right, doing, doing club-related stuff. I still had done research up into college. Mm-hmm. So I kept with another applied physics lab. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to run. Mm-hmm. Um, I had done a ski phys ed. Believe it or not, those exist. How was that? It was really fun. Freshman year, imagine, like, I don't know, on the weekends, you just, you wake up at 6 a.m., you board a bus, you knock out. At 10, you're on a mountain skiing, and then at 4, get back on the bus, you knock out, you're back at your dorm at 6 p.m. again. Wow, that's so nice. Wait, how many times a semester do you have to do that? You only had to do four trips, right? Because, I mean, the work got worse and worse. But um, it was very enjoyable. And then they have this thing called ski team. And I pursued, I did that junior year. So I did freshman and junior year. Yeah. Sophomore year, I had a little bit of a, I took a break, I guess. Oh. I, I wish I had done it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Columbia had a lot of really nice things like that. Yeah. So that was fun. I, I, love, I like to ski. You know, I mean, I think everybody now, nowadays likes to trade in their free mm-hmm. time. And, oh, you want to um, talk a little bit about that in case people don't know what that means? Oh, sure. So part of the applied math tilt brought me to like, finance stuff because I mean like those are the people who are you hear about quants and magic and stuff like that and um with the applied math background I was like oh you can solve and make money by being by doing uh, doing math and I was, it seemed like a really good career path idea but um yeah I wasn't saying I mean right now I wish I did more math in my investing but as an aside that drove me to the like, finance classes and so and then investing which is basically um you can it's it's you, you buy stuff and then you sell it at a higher rate, like a higher, higher price because other people want it more. But you can buy and sell these things called stocks, right? And then you hold on to them if you think the underlying company that it's related to is good. Like you can buy Facebook and if you really believe in Facebook and it goes up, you can sell it later at a higher price and you net a profit. Mm-hmm. So that's what you could do with your extra money. And then you could... And now, and I mean, like people probably heard of all this doing this, like, and there's a like big COVID investing phase, but there's also like things on top of stocks that are like derivatives uh, that have, that can be used to engineer even more complicated kind of bets on stocks. Like I want the price to be in between these two levels or within 30 days, I want the price to be here or something, something crazy. But then um, 
a variety of these things help you make money so then you can go spend it on whatever you want, uh, I guess. <laughs> you can use your, your math knowledge to apply it to the real world. Sure, and, and generally the, uptrend, the trend is up. So you just you put it in, you just forget about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to measure my gains in terms of sandwiches. Sandwiches? Yeah. yeah. Like how many sandwiches you've earned? Yeah. How many meals you've got? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. What are like the besides the finance side, what are other aspects or other career paths for applied math people? Well, applied math is quite flexible. It's very nice in the sense that in order to apply math these days, you will need to know a good amount of math. You need to know a good amount of CS. And um, those two skills are very good in any kind of situation where you have to model things. So data science, uh, mm -hmm. finance software engineers, mm -hmm. um, business analysts. Um, yeah, those, I guess anything a CS major can do, a applied math major could probably do at a little bit of worse rate, unless they fully committed. Um, <laughs> applied math people could probably, yeah, I'd say that it's like anything. So, so the CS alternative is still available for applied math people. I believe that's a quite a quite a lucrative field to go into, mm -hmm. um, and Very then flexible. yeah, and then with applied math, yeah. So I, I guess I don't know what the major ones are. I feel like the majority of people who do applied math probably go more into data science and then higher education kind of stuff, you know. Mm, like like becoming professors or like doing research. Yeah, academia things like that. Mm -hmm. And can yeah. you explain what data science is to people in case they haven't heard of it? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I mean, like. There are, nowadays, everything is computerized. So there is a variety of, there's a lot more data on people and, and things. And you can use that data to predict specific trends um, and do very specific things, mm -hmm. which um, a lot of companies actually need that insight for. So you could use that data to predict quantities like user engagement, uh, you know, click-through rates, um, how to improve click-through rates, you know, how to make one website look better, uh, how to recommend videos to other people. Um, and it goes even further, like forecasting how, I don't know, you can do time series forecasting for stocks. You can use time series forecasting for weather, um, a bunch of other things. But I'd say all in all, it's more like using pretty math heavy CS related tools in order to uh, uh, get insights on data Mm -hmm. And that's used in almost anything you can imagine. So uh, yeah, that's used. That's data science. But I don't know what it's going to be looking like. Is uh, it's actually a club on campus, called the Data Science Society. If you, if anybody wanted to uh, learn more about data science or specific things, that that club's pretty good. And I think they have a podcast too. Yeah, and I wonder who the host of the podcast is. Yeah. That's yeah. a good one. So Will actually has, he hosts a podcast for the Columbia Data Science Society. Is it CDDS, right? You guys call that? <laughs> CDS. Right? CD, GDS something. Okay. <laughs> um, and he talks with professors and with people who are like pretty well established in the field. And so do you want me to link it in the description? Yeah, you, you can too. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I will, I'll link it in the description below in case you guys are interested in checking that out um, and hearing more of Will's voice. <laughs> Um, so that is, yeah, so that's one of the data science clubs. What other clubs are you involved in on campus? No, this is a, this is an applied, this is a society of industrial and applied mathematics, SIAM. That's a club that I'm part of. Yeah. I'm part of the, yeah, the CDSS place people, the Columbia Data Science Society. I think that's about it. I mean, technically ski team, but they don't really do anything anymore. <laughs> that's more like a pay for play kind of thing. Like you pay them a, a rate and then they'll take you skiing. You have your MoMath job, right? Museum of Mathematics? I mean, I had. I had worked there for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. between, when did you start? Sometime in high school, I think my junior year of high school. How long have you, like, were you a tour guide for them? Yeah, like two years or so. Yeah, it started off with my friend being like, oh, I worked in the Hall of Science. I, th I think it's the Hall of Science. But there's a Hall of Science in yeah. New York. In and Queens, yeah. There. And they were like, it's a pretty chill job. It's um, you get paid. It's pretty nice. And I was like, you know what? It'd be pretty cool. Do that. Um, but they, they don't they don't take anybody who's not like a city resident at the time. So I was like, you know what? There's a museum of math. I heard. I'll look for a job there. So I became a volunteer there. 
And um, it was really nice. You know, every weekend I just go in, you know, explain things to people. Mm -hmm. And it was like my first glimpse into the city. And New York City is just such a nice place. So um, uh, those were uh, really nice memories. And it became my first job. Yeah. Did you start it because like you, you like teaching? Like, did you know that you like teaching other people or like what drove you besides like your friend also worked at the whole sign? Well, I mean, you get to go to the city every week. So that's kind of exciting. Oh, true, true, true. You get yeah. to, you get paid. Oh, no, yeah, I didn't get paid yet. <laughs> it's not like I got to go to the city every week and there's like, like nice restaurants to eat at. You know, I spend my paycheck on those restaurants. <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> Shake Shack is, it wasn't really on Long Island yet. You know, and a bunch of other things. Like it was a good time, I'd say, eating wise. And um, the people were really nice. And I think I learned a lot. And I mean, it looked good on a resume too. I was like, these are all pros, you know? <laughs> so I thought it was like a net win. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, it was, I had made some really nice memories there, like a bunch of random cool things happened. So I, 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 I really, uh, and it's always fun to be like, oh, I know I used to work at MoMath. And I mean, I, I wish I brought more friends and explained things to them there, but I feel like I've been in there. Plus, I think sometimes when I'm in the middle of the city, you need a bathroom, right? you can just stop by. Be like, yeah, oh yeah, I worked here previously. Let me just use the bathroom real quick. <laughs> so that, that happened once or twice. That's funny. Are most of the people who go there tourists or? There's actually, okay. So they mean there's school groups that come in, right? So that, that's interesting. There's always like 200 or so kids or some large number. Um, we had tourists from like Italy, random places. I remember the two, some people from SoCal at some point. I mean, a lot of you, like some, some grad students like go there because of the novelty. They host a lot of random events that in, they have like pretty good speakers. Like mm -hmm. I know Percy Diaconis was there once. Um, and uh, I think a while back, I wasn't there at the time. But there's a picture, I think, of Jeff Bezos on, on, a, on one of the rides. The I think. rides? Wait, yeah. are there, there are rides in MoMA? Well, it's not like, it's like an interactive exhibit. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you can ride it. Oh, that's cool. Wait, is it the bicycle thing? Yeah, it's the, it's, yes. Or not the, what's it called? Is there a special name? No, not really. It's called the square wheel trike. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I went there. I think I went to MoMA once, maybe for like a high school math or activity thingy but I, I kind of forgot I haven't been there in like five years probably more but <laughs> yeah I like fun time next time we go we need to bring Will and he can explain all the exhibits to us <laughs> yeah. yeah how about like outside of your jobs how about internships how is that looking oh yeah first summer at Columbia I continue to do research uh next summer I worked a tech internship at a bank and the COVID summer, I did a combination of both because uh, tech internship at the bank was six weeks. So I had some extra time on my hands. So I converted that into doing research for my lab, starting some new research and um, had projects. What kinds of projects, if you don't mind? <laughs> oh yeah, like things like the podcast, you know, I, I think I had done a little bit of contributing to open source projects just just one really one project and then um yeah starting research with another professor some cs kind of related stuff mm -hmm. yeah you how did you know that professor just by cold emailing again no not from classes this time it's a little bit easier right because you don't take in high school you didn't take classes with professors yet so it was more accessible yeah nice what um what like CS research was that like what topic was it in oh it's more like I had a final project that I just continued and converted it to something uh that would be uh like I guess kind of researchy um uh -huh. just this is a continuation of a final project basically cool for which course um it's called unsupervised or advanced machine learning oh uh, okay so what was your machine learning Oh, it was more like, um, in essence, it's like a robustness thing. It's like how to make something a little more robust to a specific kind of adversarial noise. Uh, yeah, so it was a robustness result. 
<laughs> Can you translate that into non-CS language? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> some algorithms are vulnerable to the type of data they ingest, very vulnerable. Um, and people could have built very good examples of this where the input can be uh, almost adversarial, where you're trying to mess with the output, right? Oh. And some algorithms are robust to that. They're a little stronger. They're, they can actually overcome this kind of noise to a certain, to a certain extent. So my result, well, my stuff I'm working on is along those lines. What would be like a real life example of something that is vulnerable? I know TensorFlow has a bunch of these nice examples on their website. There is this thing called like a fast, uh, I think it's a fast gradient attack or fast gradient sign attack or something like that. Um, basically, there's a nice example on the website where it is, there's a picture of a panda. They modified the picture also slightly where you, where it basically looks like the very same image, but it gets classified as like a given. It's very, very um, pertinent to like deep learning kind of stuff because uh, the models that are trained there are, how do you say that the interpolation might not be great or the generalize the generalizability that, that might not be great. Basically they memorize really well, but it's hard for them to. Like yeah. facial recognition or like image recognition. Yeah, yeah. So it's harder for them to infer certain things or just interpolate between images. Like, I mean, if you saw a picture of something that you didn't know, you try to like, you could probably guess what it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm making it, I don't know if the problem is exactly that, but it's like that. So, but that, that's one example, mm -hmm. basically. And you can look it up. I mean, maybe she can like develop to it. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I will look it up after the podcast, after yeah. filming. Yeah, that's cool. So that was kind of like your research side. So what do you actually do at internships for your major or mm -hmm. like that you've gone through? Also, just a little thing. I did applied research, applied physics research for three years and the CS thing for one year. So just, you should know, I did a lot more random research in that area too. But um, for internships, uh, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's like, I did a lot of tech ones. So it's like, you go in, it's like, they want you to build this tool mm -hmm. and you put a GUI on it and that's it. And then you just build it for them. Do they teach you how to do it or just like they assume your knowledge already? Well, I mean, they assume you can code and maybe the framework is a little different, but then it's kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. You have to get familiar with their, how they do things. So that's when you ask them questions. But with syntactical things, a bunch of other things, um, you kind of have to write, write it on your own. But then they'll always offer, you know, maybe they do, you have to write a specific number of unit tests, or they think that you, the way you worded, you, you organize something's a little bit, it could be done better. And then so you can learn from them that way. Mm -hmm. But I'd say that uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of both, like a lot of self learning and a lot of learning within how to work on a team yeah would you say it's more or less stressful than taking classes during the semester or kind of the same you know i i don't know it's like a whole different kind of vibe you don't really have in classes it's just like really stressful overall mm -hmm. like it's a little more chill however you still do have to do a good job yeah. and do a lot of work mm -hmm. but typically i mean your hours are capped you could take homework with you. Uh, I mean, you could take work home with you. But I think the way, I mean, when, when I was working at the bank, you usually couldn't remote sign in. This is pre-COVID. You couldn't remote sign in. So you you stayed between like the hours of nine to five and then you just leave. Oh, nice. So yeah. what would like, what would a typical day in your internship life look like versus a typical day in your Columbia school life look like? Yeah. So nowadays, my typical days are more like I wake up around eight ish take a walk get outside a little bit get some breakfast in me go to classes because now they're remote kind of cook myself lunch honestly yeah life's pretty boring I, I, I eat, eat dinner do homework that's it it's like it's not like i, I don't think anybody's having like ragers nowadays right so <laughs> quite tame what about before before covid some variation of that where i had walked more during the day. That's true. There was, a, there was a place where I liked to get sandwiches. I think I'd get, I tried to get a daily sandwich from there. And I think every other day I'd run more. Maybe I'd go to my lab at some point in the day. How do you determine like 
when to go into lab. Did you do it for credit or was it just like whenever you had time you went in? Uh, I mean, I was paid for the applied physics lab I was in. Oh, uh, okay, great. Nice. Because they were really nice about it. They were actually like super chill and they wanted to, and, and they were one of the few places on campus that actually pay. So okay. I was actually thinking about taking a library job, but I was like, you know what, I get paid to do the research. And, pay, and the same thing with the MoMath thing, I actually did cost benefit analysis and doing research in a lab much better than working at MoMath. So I was like, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to do this research. So that was my primary, um, so that, that was one of the pros. The second pro is that, again, I learned the majority of the things that I learned in terms of how to structure code, how to do certain things, how to apply certain things and, and, and do certain applied math things in research, right? Like the same way I learned how to build a box there and learn how to interact with the uh, command line and build a computer and such. So I continued doing that basically. Yeah. I learned a lot and it was really formative and I really appreciated that lab. So to me, it was just, I was learning, I got paid, and I got to do fun projects. Uh, nice. That's a perfect, and, perfect deal. Uh, yeah. And I had a really nice desk. And really <laughs> good, yeah. I had a really good view too. It was, it was just, it was quite ideal. That's what, um, what building was it in? Uh, it's called the Northwest Corner Building, uh, Columbia, uh, on the high floors, like above 10. That's so nice. I've never been on one of the high floors. I've only been like where the library was. Yeah, it was uh, had great views, especially at night. So it gave you incentive to stay and they had great coffee machines. I mean, I'm not too much of a fan of coffee, but I was like, wow, this stuff is pretty cool. How would you say the rigor of the college lifestyle compares to that of high school? I don't remember high school that well, to be honest. Yeah, it's a long time ago. College has been so, it's been good. It's been very good, I think, in my opinion, or well, my experience. With respect to the rigor, it really depends on the class you take. Within college, there are, you don't want to take one class. Like, there's always, like, options, right? There's always an easy, middle, hard kind of situation. And depending on what you want, you can tailor that. Mm-hmm. But everybody usually still has, the, has a path to graduate, right? So it's really choose your own adventures, much more independent. And it's, it's what you want. My college experience has been exactly what I kind of wanted to do right after high school. Um, with respect to high school, I don't really remember the rigor. I mean, I remember being stressful. I remember senior year, because it was just fun, right? <laughs> Were you, did you apply early to Columbia or was that regular decision for you? Yeah, I applied early to Columbia. Oh yeah, same, same. So you knew early and you yeah. had the entire yeah. semester like kind of free. Yeah. Yes. Why did you choose Columbia Engineering specifically for applied math? It was a really good school. I mean, all of them at a certain point were very good schools, very good options. I like, I, I mean, I love the city. I already had a taste, right? I, uh, they had a summer, they had a weekend program, high school weekend program. You did SHP too? Yeah, yeah, they had a high school, we, uh, high school weekend program. Mm-hmm. And I went there every weekend, so I was very, very familiar with it. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that kind of stuff, all together, they had like, with the core, because... I'm actually a big, uh, I was in quiz bowl in high school too. So I was um, oh, cool. that for a couple of years. So I was very into nerdy history things and, and the combination of their core curriculum kind of thing offering was actually something that I, you know, sometimes when you look at these college application things, you're like, oh, we have a core. You're like, oh, that's fun. But it was like, it was like, wow, I definitely like to do that. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, pretty good engineering and, um, fact that I already felt like I knew it pretty well it was just all like just seemed right yeah and I guess like for Columbia Engineering versus Columbia College right are there two applied math programs one in each or is it like applied math versus pure math do you know yes um so I know that I know the applied math already in the engineering it's quite a small cohort um and I had met C. uh we call Columbia College people CC people Mm-hmm. I had met CC applied math people, but they're few and far between, and their program was a little different. But they exist, and they are good people. I don't know the differences. I think maybe they take less requirements because, I mean, if in engineering school you have to get a BS, so you have to take a couple of specific intro courses and a variety of other things. So this is BS, and then CC or Columbia College is bachelor bachelor of arts. So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that degree comes with a few more responsibilities in a way uh, mm, yeah did you ever consider pure math after seeing the kind of people that existed in 
competition math in high school, I, I thought it was a safer bet to do applied math. <laughs> I mean, gotcha, my, gotcha. Uh, not, not just that, it's just, um, I, I really like putting something into a computer and getting an answer. It just seemed like magic to me. Mm -hmm. like solving problems that way. And there's so many cool tools and things. I just, just wanted to learn all about those. And mm -hmm. they, they, they can be used tools like these in pure math, but I'd say the majority of them lie kind of in the applied math to data science kind of other domains. And pure math certainly has its place. I take a, I do, I have taken a couple of like graduate math courses here at Columbia, but um, I think applied math was the correct choice. Yeah. You're also, you're a TA, right? For one of the courses? Yes, yes. I Which course was that? Machine learning. Okay, wait, so how was the TA life? How was that experience? I mean, I, I was a TA during um, this COVID time. Mm -hmm. I only differentiate this because I think the experience is probably very different. I hold office hours and I grade homeworks. And when I hold office hours, a few children, a few kids, not children, a few kids come and, um, and then we, we go through whatever problems they have. And that's about it. It's pretty mm -hmm. chill. And by, by kids, Will means students. So not like kids, kids. Well, so I'm, well, I'm a senior, right? So I think I, I reserve that word. But I do really, I do mean grown adults. You know? Grown adults. Oh, and I, we are kids, just yeah. in case people, people are confused. It is a, um, a high school coding boot camp that we run as part of SIAM. Mm -hmm. Those people are high schoolers, and I think I can call those people kids. Relative. Everything is relative. If you were speaking with someone in high school or someone who just started out in college that was interested in applied math, what resources would you recommend them, or what advice would you give to them? There is a lot around for high schools nowadays, mostly on the internet. There are a lot of really great high school programs, too. Firstly, I think you have to build your background, get really strong in a particular number. I mean, just get really strong in your understanding of math. Uh, that is like competition math helps. It's not necessary, but it helps. Watching, you know, MIT, OCW kind of stuff helps. Participating in coding competitions online helps. There are data science competitions now around, like Kaggle kind of stuff. Numerous amounts of podcasts out there made by, you know, graduate students, PhD people who've gone this path and can offer advice and definitely look out there. Uh, find yourself a mentor, get yourself a project, cold email people. But really it's just, uh, I feel like majority of my learned experiences are, we're all project-based. So I would really recommend someone, uh, you have, you should find uh, a project or make yourself a project. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the best way to learn and go about it. But also try to take as many classes as you can because the classes are like your foundation for your projects. The combination of those two, personal projects, good classes, or good resources just for learning. And there's so many on that. Would you say that most of your personal projects came from classes, like class influence? Or did you have something that you knew you wanted to do and you just started on it? I had a bunch of random personal projects. Well, now we're talking about high school, we're talking about like college. You could say both. What about like from high school to through college? I had a random one in high school. Uh, there was this one time I had gone to prom and I had made myself a um, Iron Man corsage. You know, like it was like a little Arduino project, but that was fun. I was really into that kind of like engineering, kind of electrical engineering kind of stuff. I built a hexacopter in, 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 in high school, like basically a drone type looking thing. Oh, cool. I was really into 3D printing freshman year. So I'd go to the makerspace and just like print out whatever I wanted. Hackathons are literally just personal project adventures. Competitions were always like, I mean, you sign up for them because you kind of want to be in them because you can like do something, possibly win. Like, you can work on a personal project and possibly win money, which is pretty good. So those are also a way of doing personal projects. And I mean, they don't always have to be academic. Your personal projects should be like, I want to, I don't know, run to Penn Station and get a, get a bagel there or something. It just came more, mostly out of just, I don't know, things that you thought were enjoyable or cool. Wait, what was the question again? Find, where did you find them? Your, like, how did you develop your personal projects? Yeah, you, just, you just fight off the urge to watch YouTube and you just do a little bit every day. And I think that's typically how it works. And deadlines, oh, those are the, those mm -hmm. really get you going, right? Because I slack off until the deadline. So if you set yourself a deadline, it really helps. How do you hold yourself accountable? Shame and guilt. Oh, 
<laughs> well, it's giving the real advice, the real <laughs> like, answer. Uh, I mean, for classes, it was always easy, you know, because there's a grade at the end of the day. But otherwise, just a little bit of guilt goes a long way, I guess. A little bit. You have to kind of assign that to yourself. Yeah. Do you use GCal? Is that like a thing? Nah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you plan your stuff then? Oh, I do. I, I mean, I use it for like stuff. Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. Oh, but like, do I like use the plan like personal project kind of things? I mean, like, I have a whiteboard. You can see part of it right there. I, oh, is that for your? Oh, okay. I mean, I put random stuff on there. Oh. I, I, I journal, right? It's like, hey, Will, last year was not that great. <laughs> Work on it. <laughs> <laughs> things like that. But the GCAL does help. I mean, that's mostly for class. It's like, hey, get get to class, get get awake, you know, those kind of things. I should probably use that more for uh, personal projects. That's a good way. That's good. Yeah, hold yourself accountable. I learned something today. Nice. And what about like post undergrad plans? What do you think you want to do afterwards? Yeah, so uh, most probably I'm going to probably do a master's in CS at Columbia. I applied to other CS programs, but the way it's set up already, based on how many transfer credits I could do, Columbia just seems like the most reasonable choice. Plus, I already have like roots here, you know, so it just seems like it'd work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, CS mostly because, you know, applied math great tilt but there's a bunch of once you learn enough math you also need to learn enough how to use computers to do certain things and there's a lot of exciting things that I consider I would consider like applied math kind of stuff happening in CS like with respect to machine learning and with respect to a bunch of other kind of interesting kind of problems that they encounter like numerical linear algebra kind of thing like sketching algorithms and stuff mm -hmm. um, not that I see to work in it but it would be more be like interesting to learn if I were to go to grad school yeah. so um yeah that's cool. And you said you could transfer your credits to the yes. program. How does that work? If you take too many in your undergrad, you can you can use them for your your, your graduate. So it's uh it's kind of like when you go in between schools and you can transfer credits. How long is a master's program in CS usually? Well, it's thirty credits. Okay. It's like a year. Um, if you're taking five classes, all technical, which honestly sounds like a pain. Um, so. It'd be better to take only half that, right? So you can transfer like literally half and just take? If you can get 15 above your graduation requirements. Oh. Right. So, and, and they have to be like graduate level courses, right? It's like coursework that's at the 4,000 level. True. So these, these are arbitrary numbers to most people. But um, the way it kind of works at Columbia is that when you get up to the fourth, when your class starts with 4,000, it's a hard class. Yeah. And then the higher you go, it's supposed to be harder. So how many, how many grad level classes have you taken? I think I took my first one like sophomore year. Oh my um, God. How was that jump? Like from 1,000, 2,000? Well, I mean, some 4,000 levels are very doable. Oh, okay. Yeah, I took like some numerical methods courses and some uh, financial engineering courses. And, I mean, the financial engineering ones sound sellout, but I assure you we use some pretty complicated things to solve some very interesting differential equations, which falls under the purview of applied math. So I'd say that's applied math stuff. But I mean, like with all the APs and stuff, I was able to skip a bunch of stuff. So I got started early. So I was able to take a bunch of the things I was interested in. So yeah, that's, that's about when I started. I take it out at least two or three a semester. So you can interpolate. That's a lot. That's like intense. Some, some of the 4,000 level classes are included inside the course. So please don't think of me as like a stressed out person all the time. I had a lot of hobbies, believe it or not. We believe you, Will. We believe you. Believe me. <laughs> I am not a crazy out person. And people can do this. This is a reasonable schedule to keep. So talking about like hobbies and fun things, what's your favorite Columbia tradition to kind of wrap up this podcast episode? Some of the things I love to do are like the tree lighting ceremony, like Mm -hmm. that, that winter always great surf and turf basically sometimes they give you like it's so bougie you know they give you steak and lobster and you can eat as much as you want it's like great they have a bacchanal great actually a lot of the things are pretty great you know uh, <laughs> i can't really choose but i mean like you know it's 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 fantastic and then and then they had like a lot of hike they had like pre-orientation hiking programs like freshman year you did co-op yeah huh. i'm a hopper that's that's even before NSOP. That's before the like the gen, general new student orientation program. So before that, you can have your outdoorsy type of wilderness yes. experience. Yes, yes, it was it was really enjoyable. I still talk to the people that I got out of there, especially mm -hmm. you know the the people that lead you on the hike, the upperclassmen. They're like your mom and your dad. You know, I still talk to my mom. 
all, the, all a lot of the things that Columbia does is so silly, so funny, so good. Like who gives you massive amounts of steak and lobster or lights up uh, a bunch of nice trees for you? Would you more identify with alma mater or Rory? My alma mater. Rory's like, I don't really know. Rory gives me the uh, more fun, exciting vibe. Alma mater gives me more stoic, calm, peace work vibe. You know, the Athena vibe, the wise kind of thing. I, I like that a little more, but I, I'd say my Rory side, I have my alma side too. Um, <laughs> Did you find the owl under alma mater? Oh, you spoiled it for everybody who hasn't, right? Oh, wait, am I not? Is that not a thing? I thought people knew. I mean, it's more like the way I was introduced to it was somebody brought me in front of it in high school. Like, like I think I was like a sophomore or a junior. You'd go to the city. You'd go see Columbia. Yeah. And some people were like, there's an Easter egg here. You see it. And I mean, like, I found it on my own because I was just standing in the right spot, really. And I took that as a sign. Maybe I should come to Columbia. Oh. Yeah, I saw it. And I was like, wow, dope. Pretty dope. Uh, I like it here. Very nerdy. Keeps with the vibe. And I, I actually, in Quiz Bowl, the, the trivia thing that I did, I was the mythology player. So I was like, ooh, I like that. I like the vibe here. I haven't even tried looking for it yet. I might do it senior year when we go back. You got to stand in the right spot. So feel free to circle and circle, circle, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope, I hope you do have the opportunity to. But see, you didn't even need the owl to know that this is the school you wanted to go to. Or like the luck to get you in, right? So very impressive. <laughs> what about, we'll do another this or that. Five Guys or Shake Shack? They're both really good. I mean, like when it comes to food, I love all food. So I really can't say. No discrimination against any food. They're both really good. It really depends what you want. Shake Shack, you know, they got that nice bun with the crispy smash burger. And then Five Guys, they get you a real burger with like... <laughs> We see fries in your bag, as many as you want, you know, and they have like the vibe of like a real American burger place and Shake Shack gives you like a New Yorky kind of bougie kind of, you know, you can get a real nice smash burger here vibe and they're both delicious. So just depends on what you're feeling that day. And Shake Shack is closer to campus though, right? What, what, um, where is Five Guys? It's like on 110? Yeah, I mean, you're splitting hairs at that point, right? It's like two blocks down. <laughs> to me, I love to walk. It's a benefit, even if it's yeah. too blast far there. True. Burn some calories before you down that burger. Thanks, Will. I mean, I think that's a good and tasty note to end off on. Do you have any last <laughs> minute advice or like last words to people who are applying to college now and who are going through this entire process? I mean, everybody has their own reasons for applying to a specific college, right? Mm -hmm. um, be it they're interested in a specific topic that's really good at that college be it that they want to be at that school because they have the culture there and things like that. You can't really be choosing wrong there. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you do like good, thoughtful, insightful kind of research into what you're looking into, know exactly what your plan is and make sure it's like a long, like it's not just like a short-term plan, but a long-term plan. Here, maybe your future objectives is as hazy as they might be. Think long and hard about that. Maybe journal about that. That'll be helpful. And then you can look back on it, you know, when you're, when you're a senior and it'd be really, uh, be kind of a sentimental kind of feeling. Yeah. So probably just, I don't know, take a, while you're applying to college, take a minute, write that down, write a letter to yourself or something like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like it'll help give you more closure and if you're, if you're nervous about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good advice. And journaling, like in general, is good advice to continue throughout college and beyond. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great note to end off on. Thank you, Will, for joining us today. And if you're, watching this as a video podcast on YouTube, then make sure to hit that thumbs up and comment down below and subscribe for more episodes. And if you're listening to this on any other podcast streaming platform, then be sure to give it a thumbs up and follow. Will, we do this thing on the podcast where we high five. Ready? Three, two, one. Come on. Okay, yay! Okay. Thank you, Will. And thank you everyone for joining us. And we will see you in the next episode. Goodbye. Pleasure.